Hello, Internet. I am Corion, your witch in residence here on YouTube. And today I'm going to continue our Lord of the Rings series and talk about the two towers. Now, there's a lot of great stuff we could talk about in this movie. We could talk about what you do when you lose a leader or how to deal with some a friend, an ally, a loved one falling under the influence of another. Um, we could even probably talk about the difference between the noble Aragorn and the Fellowship and the cowardice of Wormtongue. Uh, you know, the, the slime ball who tries to weasel their way into power, but ultimately fails. Um, instead, though, I want to talk about the Battle of Helm's Deep and not the battle itself, because I'm sure there's been many tactics YouTube channels that have gone over the, the tactics involved of laying siege and defending against the siege and all of that. I want to talk about why they went to Helm's Deep. Because at the end of the day, that's the most important part of this. It was a defensive place that they knew well, and it was a place they could make a stand. Because there comes a time when a man has to stand up. He has to draw his line in the sand and say, I'm not going to take any more from outside forces, from bullies, from whoever. Because a human only can be pushed so far before we have to strike back. And when we strike back, we have to strike back hard using all our tools. Whether that's you know, Aragorn's understanding of tactics, you know, Gimli's determination in battle, uh, Legolas's preci precision, perhaps even the, the Hobbit's mastery of, of skill, or who knows, maybe even uh, your local wizard's gift of words uh, and knowledge and the ability to pull someone through a mental dojo, as an example, okay? Those sometimes are the skills you have to use. So when it's time to fight, pieces you need to know. The first, make sure you're picking the battlefield and not the opponent is picking the battlefield. Okay? Two, make sure you're fighting with the most advantages you have. If you have size and strength, use that to your advantage. If you're quick and nimble, keep moving. If you're smart, put them slightly off balance and then make them keenly aware of the mistake it was to ever challenge you in the first place. You don't even have to do anything per se that's particularly hard or evil or what have you. Just say something that you know will strike a nerve. Right? It doesn't have to be mean. It doesn't have to do anything. But just something that will strike a nerve that will throw them off balance. So they can't really pull themselves together in a fight. Make them make mistakes. Resort to the most base tactics that are easily ignored. Because... They had to resort to them. Sometimes in a modern day fight, it's not about beating your opponent into submission. It's about them seeing how foolish it was to take you on in the first place and forcing them into a position where they have no choice but to resort to something that could potentially get somebody else involved. I mean, we see that with Russia and Ukraine, right? There are a lot of examples on how to fight, but the point is, how do you choose when to take a stand? Okay. That comes down to a personal code. Okay. And a personal code that one should follow. Okay. If one doesn't have one, then they are directionless. They are without the capability to stand to you in the first place. 
my code, for example, says that insults should not go unchallenged because it invites further insult. Um, you know, my code also states that if a friend is being hurt, that's when it's time to stand and aid them. And thankfully, I'm surrounded by wonderful people that would come to my aid should I ever need them. You know, and I hope you've surrounded yourself with friends like that too. We've talked about fellowship and friendship in the previous episode. This is important stuff. Okay? Prepare the battlefield. Prepare the terrain. Know what you're getting into. Know what the rules of the battlefield are. In Canadian Tactics Manuals, the first page used to be all of these tactics are guidelines. At the end of the day, terrain dictates the battle. So, know your terrain. If you're going to be fighting on a hill, be sure you're on the top of the hill. I mean, Obi-Wan made it clear, take the high ground, right? If you're going to be fighting in an open field, are there any major holes in the ground, any pit traps that potentially you could use to your advantage? Um, if you're on the internet, know what the admins are looking for. See if you can convince the other person to put themselves into a position where they've, you know, made themselves vulnerable in some way to the rules of that terrain. Make sure when you fight, you don't start it, but you finish it. Because at the end of the day, that's what counts the most. Okay? These are important lessons that you can take from the Battle of Helm's Deep. You can also take that when you're pushed to the absolute breaking point, when you have no other choice, you have to charge forward. Because at the end of the day, and I guess this is the best way to put it, at the end of the day, a man stands up for his words. A man stands up for his deeds. A man stands up for those he cares about. If you can't do that, then, I mean, you're not really a man, right? And when I say man, I do mean that in the broader human term, okay? I don't mean that in a gender-specific way. So consider these words, okay? Think about it the next time you're tempted to fight. Do you have the advantage of terrain? Do you have allies that will help you if things go slightly askew, right? Do you have access to resources that the other party doesn't have, and are you prepared to use them? Right? Are you willing to engage in a little bit of deception? Because at the end of the day, all battle is deception. Okay? It's about deceiving your opponent to being where you want them to be, which was ultimately what Helm's Deep was. Helm's Deep was an invincible structure, impossible under normal circumstances to breach. Now, as it turns out, uh, Saruman had something special in mind to be able to deal with the problem. But even then, it was still a hard slog for them because the terrain so favored the defenders. Get used to that. Build that for yourself. If you don't have a situation where you haven't built or modified or understand the terrain enough to use it to your advantage, don't fight there. Just don't, okay? Pick a new battleground, a different battleground, right? And, you know, show them exactly what kind of clown shoes they're wearing, right? Because sometimes they need that. You know, in the modern day, I would never advise causing bodily or physical harm. Sometimes the most important thing you can do in a fight is teach, right? Saruman learned a very valuable and very important lesson that, that day. He sent basically all the forces he had to go take Helm's Deep. And what happened? He got flanked in Isengard by a group of angry rampaging trees. Right? That's a pretty critical mistake. Right? Leaving yourself unprotected and open to uh, any kind of attack. Right? And it's relatively foolish. Right? 
especially if you think you're in the superior and you're dealing with somebody, you know, who does not appear to be as strong as you are, right? If they have an understanding of tactics, if they have an understanding of guile, if they're cagey bastards, for lack of a better term, it's important to know that going in and be prepared for it and be ready for the situation of, okay, what happens if all of this goes sideways? What's the fallout? What do I lose if I don't win? These are important things to keep in mind, right? All of this, you know, should have been first and foremost on Saruman's mind. After all, if it wasn't, you know, critical to Saruman to make sure he had protected himself from any sort of potential uh, assault, you know, he may not have fallen so hard and so far. But, you know, people who think they've created themselves to be invincible, who have a massive army at their disposal, often will feel unbeatable. Take a look at Putin, for example, right? I mean, he has a massive army. He thinks he's unkillable. Yet the Ukraine is showing him time and time again, it's not going to be that easy, okay? A person defending what they truly believe in is more powerful than 10 hired thugs. And a person who is willing to stand up for what they believe in is just about unkillable. And I, I would argue that that is, in real life, the biggest takeaway from Afghanistan. Okay? Um, I would also say it's an important lesson to Helm's Deep, too. These people were fighting for their families. These people were attempting to make sure that no matter what happened, their people would live on. That's a very powerful thing to fight for. That's a very important thing to fight for. And when you've backed someone into a corner like that, they're going to do everything in their power to fight to the last man because of how important and how valuable that is. They'll use whatever tactics they need to. Even if some of them seem a little deceptive, those tactics are valid. Right? There's a famous saying, All fa all's fair in love and war. And the war is declared, you need to be ready to use what you have at your hands to gain the advantage. Even if the person thinks it's not much of an advantage, they think you're trying to fight dirty. Look, I was always taught if it's worth fighting for, it's worth fighting dirty for. Even if you're not actually fighting dirty, you're just making them think you are, right? I mean, heck, take a look at one of the lessons from Ukraine. You know, Putin's got the world convinced that he's got his fingers on the nuclear button. Does he? I don't think he actually does. Uh, I don't think he is ever going to pull that trigger. But so long as he can make people think he is, people will be more reluctant to challenge him. You know, if they didn't fear Sauron's magic, they wouldn't have done what they needed to do here, right? And at the end of the day, like I said, be ready for those reinforcements, right? If you have true friends, if you have a fellowship, if you have people beside you willing to step up because they know you and they care about you and they respect you, then they will come. The Rohirrim will charge in, being led by your crazy wizard friend, right? And we all have one of those, so. The point is, only a fool fights an uphill battle. And only the king of fools thinks themselves invulnerable while fighting an uphill battle. And that's ultimately what Sauron can take away from the Battle of Helm's Deep. Okay, so let's recap a little bit. Pick your battlefield. Make sure you understand it. Make sure that you have plans for what happens if things go wrong. Make sure you have strong allies. Don't start the fight, but finish it. And of course, the last and most important lesson of all of it is to remember that if you start the fight, you have to be prepared that the people involved are going to fight like mad bastards if needed to take down an opponent. And at the end of the day, that's what the defenders of Helm's Deep did. Um, 
you know, normally I assign homework or something along those lines, ask you to think about something, consider it. You know what? I'm going to say, let's not do homework today. Let's live and enjoy and celebrate all the victories we've had over the last while and enjoy them. Hard times are just around the corner. They always are. But if we take the time to live and enjoy the moment, then we can use that energy to shield us for the times to come. Thank you very much, everybody. Merry meet, merry part, and merry meet again. Take care. Bye-bye.